Thank you. And yes, welcome to this morning service. And as we gather, we light a candle as a reminder of Christ's presence with us. And also as a reminder that Christ is a light in the darkness. And the darkness cannot extinguish him. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 32. And I'm going to ask you, the congregation, to respond in the verses in red. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. In the spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the of a prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curved with a bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather here this morning, as we have heard the call to worship you, as we have heard the call to turn to you and confess our sin, because in confessing our sin we find forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. We take this time to confess those things which are hurtful to you, to others, and to ourselves. And so in this silence, we confess our sin before you. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and just, and when we confess our sin to you, you forgive us of all iniquity. And so we hear those words of grace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn, hymn 66. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
Amen. You may be seated. But as going to a time of prayer as we just pray and we thank God and just praise God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, there is so much to be concerned about. There is so much happening in the world that can distract us from that which is loving, that which is beautiful, that which brings life. But in this moment, we want to celebrate life. We want to celebrate your presence with us. We want to celebrate your faithfulness, Lord. We think of those who have been able to join praise you. Lord, we want to thank you that we are moving into spaces where we are able to engage a little more freely, where we are able to interact with a little less fear. And so we thank you that you lead, that you guide, that you are present even in the most difficult of times. And this morning as a new day starts, as we worship Yah. At the start of a new week, we want to just worship you, glorify you, and lift your holy name, and just say, God, you are worthy. You are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. Often we forget. In the busyness of life, we forget. In our own small worlds where we get distracted by those things which gnaw at us, which causes anxiety. We forget, Lord, to honor you rightly. And so in this moment, we just want to praise you and worship you. For you are God. And we lift up your name this day. And may you be glorified in this service, but also in this coming week in our lives that you may receive all glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to call our readers to come forward. Um, the first reading from the Old Testament is from Joshua chapter 5, and we'll be reading from verses 9 to 12. Good morning, everyone.
Amen. Thank you. Going to ask the stewards to take up the offertory at this time. Let us pray. Lord, as we bring you these, our tithes and our offerings, Lord, we know that we do this not because you need it, not because we are doing it in order to receive something from you, but rather we do this as an act of worship, as a reminder to ourselves that all that we have is a gift from you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take these, that you would multiply them, that you would sanctify them, that you would use it for the furtherance of your kingdom, that other people will know, Jesus, that you live through this giving. And, Father, as we bring these offerings, as we bring these tithes, we also want to acknowledge, Lord, that we look to you for healing, for health, for your presence in us. Lord, there are those among us who are suffering physical illness. We pray for their healing. There are those who are suffering emotionally, Lord. We pray that you would embrace them, that you would touch them, that you would comfort them, that they would know your love for them in these moments. Lord, we think of our land, we think of our country, we think of the economic disparity, we think of the turmoil, we think of those who do not have. We pray for your provision. We also pray, Lord, for... that they will realize that life is not about wealth or about self-interest, but that we are called into community to care for each other, to love each other, to reach out to the least, the lost, the marginalized. Lord, we pray for our world, and specifically we want to bring Ukraine to you. We ask for a halt to evil that your kingdom may come and that your will may be done, that peace may reign in this world. And so, Lord, we offer these our gifts, but we also want to offer ourselves to be used in fulfilling your partnership, your call upon our lives, to partner with you, to bring about your kingdom here on earth. And so use us to reach those who need to be reached for you, whether through material provision, or just the ministry of presence. Here we are, Lord. Take us, use us, sanctify us, multiply us. We pray for all the gifts that have been given through other means, whether the sacrifice of time or electronic transfers or deposits, whichever way, Lord. Take and use. For your kingdom's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Our New Testament reading, well, the Gospel reading rather, comes from Luke chapter 15, and I'll be reading from verses 1 to 3, and then jumping to verses 11b to 32. It's a fairly long reading, and it's a fairly well-known reading, so don't let that make you switch off. Try and pay attention afresh. And whilst we're doing that, I'm going to remove my mask. I'm not expecting anybody else to come close at this stage. We've done the readings and the offertory, and I think I'm sufficiently distant. So, and so Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 3, and then 11b to 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So, they, so he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then, he said, then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for them. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Jesus, author of life, come speak life to us. Holy Spirit, move in and among us, open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive your word. Father, we thank you that your word does not return empty, but accomplishes its purpose. And we ask that your word will accomplish its purpose in our lives this day. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. Amen. We're traveling through Lent at the moment. We're actually just past the halfway mark. Um, 
think yesterday was day 23 of the devotions. And so the journey has started on Ash Wednesday when we invited you to journey with Jesus to the cross. Where we asked the question, where is your journey taking you? And as we've journeyed through Lent, as we've gone through this season, I'm hoping that you've made space and made time to engage with God in new ways. Maybe some of you have fasted, maybe some of you have tried to do something a little bit different. But I pray that you've taken this Lenten journey seriously. And if you maybe haven't, if you've gotten distracted by the world and all its calls and demands, um, there's still time, there's still time. Engage afresh. You see, Lent is a time that we remember Jesus' 40 days in the desert when he was tempted. And we sort of use that as an example to us to draw closer to God. As Jesus used the 40 days to prepare for his ministry, we use this time. but also for the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So we follow Jesus to the cross, to the grave, but we continue to follow him to resurrection, to new life. And that's what Easter is about. Easter is about new life. And that's the ultimate goal, is resurrection, is new life. And so what we go through, the things we give up in our lives, the things we die to, the stuff we fast from, is not for the sake of making us feel sorry for ourselves or to flagellate ourselves or to prove what great Christians we are. But rather it's to get rid of things that maybe draw us away from life, that draw us away from God. Things that lead us on a path that doesn't follow Christ. Today's readings are all full, in my opinion, of life. Um, and, and I don't often look at all the lectionary readings for the day. I sometimes, you know, pick one or two. And, and, but today, all the lectionary readings just spoke volumes to me. And so I've tried to just briefly touch on them. I don't have hours to preach because we still have an ASM. And I'm aware of that. So... Um, I will keep it brief, but I just want us to look at the passages, um, and especially Luke, the prodigal son. Um, I can preach like a whole series on the prodigal son, I think, but I won't. Um, but, but just, it's a beautiful passage, and there's so much in it. You see, Luke he writes the gospel, and he looks at the humanity of Jesus, but also the humanity and the misunderstandings about I think about the gospel, about God, about who Jesus is, about sin. Um, from those around Jesus, the disciples, the crowds, the Jews, the Pharisees. And always Jesus is moving in Luke's gospel towards the least, the lost, the poor, the marginalized. And so there's a beauty within Luke's gospel that speaks about about and to those on the outside, those on the periphery. And today's reading is no different. It talks about the lost son. We talk about the prodigal son. But it's the lost son. It's the son who goes off and gets lost. And we know the story well. I think we've all heard it an umpteenth time. And sometimes when, I don't know if you're anything like me, when you see it comes up, you go... <gasps> Again, you know. And that's why I say just engage with it afresh. You know, try and read it afresh with new eyes. It's the problem. Sunday schools are great. But we, we, we go through these same stories, you know. Um, and, and after a while, we, we, we don't engage with them anymore. And sometimes it's healthy just to look at it with fresh eyes. And that's what I want us to do this morning. I also want to look at what we understand as salvation with fresh eyes this morning. As Methodists, we... We, we, we talk about the order of salvation. We talk about something that's called original sin, where we're all born into. You know, Eve ate the apple and sin entered the world, however that might have panned out. Um, you know, we, we're born into sin. We see that. We, we've prayed for needs. We know the world is broken. 
We know that even within ourselves, even if we try and fool ourselves, there are things within us which we have to call sin. It's unloving. There are things within me that rise up, especially when I'm stressed, you know. There's something that rises up in me that wants to lash out. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Eh? <laughs> but that's what we call original sin. And if left to our own devices, we just sort of degenerate to a place um, that is just awful. And we can look at people like uh, Putin. You know, he's not the first and he won't be the last. But where power and greed and selfishness push us, push us, push us, and we end up in a place that can be described only as evil. But what we also recognize is that God doesn't leave us in that place, that we've got something called prevenient grace, that God is working in our lives before we even know who God is or aware of God, that God is there gently nudging, leading, guiding there's a poem called The Hound of Heaven. It talks about God pursuing us all the time. It's beautiful. Dallas Willard also speaks about the Hound of Heaven. God who will not leave us alone. Who, no matter how far you try and run from God, God is there confronting, calling, reaching out. And so we, we, we're in the situation, but God is working, and God brings us to a place through God's prevenient grace where we can acknowledge God, recognize those things in our lives that need to change, realize that on our own we can't do this, look at what Jesus has done who came to reconcile us to God, we saw that in the Corinthian reading, that God made us friends with God through Jesus. Through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, we are reconciled to God. And we can come to that place where we say, God, I need you. I want to. I want to be in relationship with you. We call that justification. I am made right with God in that space. And I'm not just left now and said, okay, well, fine. You now tick a box and you're saved. Okay, we tend to do that. Luckily, not too much as Methodists, but... As evangelical Protestant types, there are many who just as long as you've accepted Jesus into your heart, you're done, you're dusted. We count numbers. And unfortunately, some of that seeps into us. But the truth of the matter is, as Methodists, uh, we believe in what's called sanctification. Okay? Some of us think of it as a swear word. But sanctification means I become more and more like Jesus. That God doesn't just say, okay, you're all right now, you've accepted Jesus. One day when you die, you'll go to heaven. Okay? No, God says, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to journey with you through life, day by day, moment by moment. I want you to be a partner person with me to bring my kingdom to bear in the year and now. I want you to show my love. That's what God wants. That's what salvation is, folks. Salvation's not a ticket so that when I die, I go to heaven. No, salvation is entering into relationship with God in the year and now. John in his gospel says, eternal life is to know Jesus. It's not when I die, I go to heaven. It's to know God now. To have relationship with God now. That death does not interrupt. That continues after death. Because the truth of the matter. Saying I'm getting married now. So that when I'm old. I'm not alone. I've got somebody to look after me. And I go out and I do my own thing. But I'm married. I'm married. So it's fine. That is how ludicrous it is. If we think of salvation only as the year after. There's relationship now. And so for me, that is the journey. Wesley says that we can get to a place where we're perfect, that we can get to a place called Christian perfection, which if you wrestle deeply, and I have, I've read his sermons and gone, mm, I don't know, but maybe... 
Uh, 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 Peter Story says that Christian perfection is not a, uh, not a doctrine that was found wanting, but rather, and, and then left, it was rather a doctrine that was found difficult and therefore abandoned by us. Um, there's a sense in which Wesley says we can come to a place where all our actions, everything we do is motivated by love. And I think he's right. There are few, of, few people who get there. I almost said few of us are nowhere near there. If I look at some people like Mother Teresa, and, and I'm going to be controversial now, I think there are non-Christians who imbued that too. Uh, if I look at people like Gandhi, you know, um, some people, uh, I think Tutu was close to it too, you know, that their motives and their motivations are by love. And so it doesn't mean that we don't necessarily, that we follow the strict letter of the law, but Wesley specifically said that we follow the law of love. You know, where we no longer act out of selfishness, but we act and we're motivated by love. doesn't mean we're free from making mistakes, but we're motivated by love. And that's where God wants us to get to. Um, Romans 8 verses 28, I, I say this often, so if I've said it here before, forgive me. But Romans 8 28 says that, and we know it well, all things work together. Eh? God works all things together for good for those who love Him. And we stop there. Because God can sort this out for me. But no, if we read verse 29, it says, For God, those God fore, predestined, God foreknew were to be transformed into the image and likeness of His Son. You see, God works all things together for good to transform us into the image of Christ. God, if you allow Him into the worst of the worst situations, will use that situation to make you more like Jesus. And that is the ultimate good. I'm hoping you hear me. Okay. Because I'm going to get sidetracked on a whole different sermon if you don't hear me. <laughs> It's not the good that we sometimes think it's good. Okay? It's not, okay, I'm going through financial difficulty now so that God can give me lots of money next week. No. I'm going through financial difficulty now. The good that God can work in this is to make me less dependent and fearful on money, but to make me more like Jesus. Depending and trusting in God. Very big difference. But that's a separate sermon. What I want to say in summary as I conclude is that salvation is about relationship and God changing us, molding us, shaping us, making us more like Jesus. In the big passage in Joshua, we read that God says, I have washed or I have removed the yoke. I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. Other translation says, the shame. God in our sense of justification, God deals with our past, our guilt, our shame. God doesn't leave it there. God moves it further and He says that we become the righteousness of God in Christ. God, somehow something happens that God starts moving and working in us. That Christ, who knew no sin, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And that's a dual thing, as I've said. There's the sense of instant justification, but there's also the process of sanctification. And so we become the righteousness of God immediately, but also incrementally. Um, again, Peter Story says that, or I think, no, it might have been Hully who said that, Christ's righteousness is impute to us, okay? God imputes Christ's righteousness to us. We are seen as righteous. But that's not left there. We're also imparted to us. And that's the process. So it's this both and thing. Some denominations say that we never become 
any better. God just sees us as righteous. That's imputed righteousness because of what Jesus has done. We as Methodists say, yes, and we are transformed and formed. And that's what the Corinthians reading says. But what I want you to leave with as we close the sermon is that it is all about relationship at the end of the day. All of this talk about sanctification, justification, means nothing without love. It's about relationship. The prodigal son, the father embraces the prodigal son. Before the son is cleaned up, he comes home smelling like a pigsty, literally. The father runs and embraces him. He says, I love you. Welcome home. I'm so glad you're here. Let's clean you up. But I'm grateful you're here. And that is what salvation's all about. It's about relationship. It's God saying, come here. I love you. I'm so glad you're home. Yes, we'll clean you up. We'll get you a new robe and sandals and a ring and a, probably a shower or whatever. But that's not the important part. The embrace happens while you're still dirty. You see the prevenient grace and the change. And so I'm asking that you will use this Lenten period as we journey to the cross. That you will use this to evaluate where you are. Maybe you're like the sun and you're eating pig food. And maybe this Lent you need to come to yourself, as the text says. Come to your right mind. Come to your senses. You don't need to fix yourself clean, have a shower, new clothes, shave, whatever you need, and then go home. No, you go where you are, you stand up and you turn home. Whatever you're going through, however knee-deep in sin you are, whatever your struggles are, you don't need to fix yourself to come to God. Just turn and go home. And your heavenly parent will run to embrace you. And let us pray. Father, we don't understand fully the mystery of your love. But what we do know, Lord, is that you constantly invite us into relationship. That you constantly call us to become more and more the people you have created us to be. And yet we know within us there are all these things that keep pulling us away, keep drawing us towards those spaces and those places which don't bring life. And so this morning, Lord, we want to just turn to you. For some of us, the idea of returning home feels intimidating. For others, we feel ashamed. For others, it just seems an impossibility. But wherever we are on our journey, give us the strength to stand up, to turn to you. And give us an understanding of your arms, which are wide open, welcoming us home. Embracing us as we are. Not rejecting us, not turning your back upon us. But embracing us and welcoming us. And saying, I love you. Let us use this Lent time wisely, Lord. And thank you. Thank you that you don't leave us alone, but that you pursue us. Thank you that you constantly draw us to you. Thank you that you love us and that you want us to be people who make a difference in this world. People who you can not only have a relationship with, but people that you can rely on to partner with you, to bring your kingdom to bear in this place. And so we ask that you would use us, that you would strengthen us, and that we would be able to rightly love you in return, Lord. We we'll ask this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is 267. Thank you.
Oh, there we go. Love divine or love's excelling. 